Hello everyone, today we talk about early and high medieval Armenian infantry, mostly from Byzantine sources, as you can expect. The uh, model that I use in the thumbnail is based on a 10th century uh, Armenian source, uh, a casket uh, that shows uh, obviously at, at that point a strong Byzantine influence that had always been there, telling the truth, from a long time. It will start, in fact, from from antiquity now. Uh, so this video can fit um, uh, actually a pretty long range of uh, of Armenian infantry sort of uh, typologies, right? Especially for medieval times, given that as we will see. Uh, I mean, how many types of infantrymen can there be uh, in a pre-industrial society? And in this context, that does grow, has ups and downs, as we will see now, but that also has a lot of continuity, even with the past. You know, we talked a bit about Caucasian warfare, we will come back on it at some point. There is no playlist, but you can easily find um, that through the search function on, on Schwerpunkt. Um, and we will naturally make and hopefully make other videos uh, on the same topic. I also made uh, a bit about the Byzantine auxiliaries during, in fact, more or less the same period, uh, including the Armenians, so we will say already there there is some sort of um, mostly brainstorming about the concept of, again, how much did a, an Armenian infantryman differ from a Kurdish one, for example. Um, but this is also in part the the, the interesting aspect within the broader Byzantine, uh, and so let's stress universal uh, empire, especially as far as the Armenians were concerned. Um, provided, however, that as you know, the Caucasus was invested by Islamic invasions, the Armenians had a pretty tormented history. This was always a, a, a feudal country, right? The same Armenians, uh, even without uh, outsiders, were naturally not particularly. Um, you know, tranquil with themselves. Uh, it was a significantly militarized society. There were lots of castles everywhere. The ground is nightmarish, to say the least. Hence, you already understand the importance of infantry in these contexts, especially in siege warfare. Um, albeit, we will see it now, um, Armenian warfare was mostly about cavalry, not just because of the feudal bases uh, of the country, but because there is a, an important degree of influence from, from the steppes, um, a necessity just to have even mounted infantry or troops that, however, are quite quick to mount this mount. So every time we make videos about infantry, there is a proper playlist about that. Bear in mind that, especially in contexts like these, um, these guys were infantrymen, yes, but they were also cavalrymen at the same time. The way he chose this, right, uh, it's based on some considerations um, that I make before sort of stereotyping the type of um, military unit type that I want to uh, discuss. Um, so when we look at, of course, Roman influence in Armenia, we, we, we go back a very long time, right? The uh, reputation, however, of the Armenians within the Roman army is something that starts occurring uh, from late antiquity, right? Essentially, the heyday of uh, Armenian reputation, if anything, from a military point of view, within the empire is from the third to the eighth centuries. So, actually, the the type of trooper we're looking at now, albeit particularly important, uh, and in in numbers, especially within the imperial ranks, still was sort of passing a phase where Armenia had. Uh, in many ways failed as a unitary state, or at least there were big powers that could hegemonize the entire region, but that would always be reliant, in fact, on an ever more feudal system, uh, which uh, on the longer run, as you know, was not... Uh, Armenia would maintain its national cultural character, etc., and identity. Um, but uh, at the same time, it would end up somebody else's um, influence, right? And so we will see it because uh, historically this had always occurred, right? This was a, the crossroads between the Hellenistic and the Persian tradition. You have the Byzantines, the Arabs, the Turks, etc. 
contributing to the shaping of local warfare that had never fully been, in fact, either of, of each of these, right? Even in Roman times, as you know, the region had been contended um, uh, by, by the, the Persians, the Sasanians, in fact, occupied Armenia after the treaty with, with Rome uh, in 363. And this is also the time which Armenia has uh, already converted to Christianity. And from then on, the um, local authority, as essentially a, a subjugated area, at least of a sort of client state or something, that had already been historically, but that is announced uh, over time, and also the, the, the late antique crisis, uh, early medieval uh, turbulence, the migration here, etc. Again, the steps are very, very close. The Armenians had been historically habituated for a very long time to cope with waves of nomadic invaders, even just maybe single war bands, right? But given the fact that the land was, was fairly permeable, right, um, this, the same militarization and fortification of the region would um, would be able to, to absorb it, to, to however be able to need him to receive it in a uh, with defensive investment um, to say the least um, and this is the reason why in early medieval times you look at the country being ruled by a uh, turbulent warrior aristocracy which had again always characterized uh, the land but at this point uh, reinforces further uh, its its power uh, you had the uh, Ishkans as the uh, greater aristocracy and the Nakarars as the lesser one. They all lived in their own castles that, as we'll see now, were really many uh, all across this, this territory. As it was really normal at the time, but even more right for, for a country that with this particular orography, lots of mountain warfare, and again, you, as we were saying before, that's where infantry actually comes into play. Is um, mountaineers had always uh, provided with tough infantry all, all over the Mashrek. Um, and feudalism was, uh, however, reinforcing itself. Right? This moment of crisis had brought many of these uh, peasants that had always been under somebody's uh, protection right? to increase like their dependency on these rulers and so also to form as we will see now important um, retinues following uh, at the in an increasingly mounted way uh, under the the control the command uh, the dispositions of this this aristocracies the Nakarars uh, in particular as the uh, lesser uh, knights right seemed just like in other places in the world more prone to mercenarism, right? And that's where you start seeing lots of them, uh, especially in the West, given that at the end of the day, that was the richest place. The Byzantine Empire uh, offered them a lot of, uh, of opportunities. As early as the mid-6th century, Procopius of Caesarea tells us that uh, as many as 17 Armenian generals were present uh, in the imperial army, most of the Byzantine military aristocracy could claim Armenian a ancestry, which is something recurring actually in Byzantine history later on. There is also this called uh, Armenian dynasty, etc. This had been going f for a long time. We imagine this peripheral province that, of course, sees a lot of wealth uh, and especially a more robust centralized uh, institutional uh, structures than the neighboring Persia. It was essentially a feudal system aside from you know, the attempt of centralization in Mesopotamia that, however, was basically destroyed by the Romans um, and eventually taken over by the Arabs. Uh, and so they preferred at this point to serve uh, en masse, as you understand here, in the Byzantine army. In the late 6th century, you find the Emperor Maurice uh, cultivating uh, the Armenian aristocracy uh, especially encouraging the Nakarars to settle around Pergamon uh, in, uh, in western Anatolia, basically on the Aegean. Uh, and this, again, is also an early practice like settling 
uh, outsiders in a way. Again, Armenia had always been sort of of a frontier as a wall, but it, it was really a deep one. You know that um, essentially Anatolia is quite big, right? The the more distant you go from from the Bosphorus, of course, the more uh, the landscape changes. It, it, the Anatolia really is, it, it's it's continental dimension. It, it's how later on, before Manzikert, the Byzantines had managed to establish um, the uh, quasi-feudal bases of their Tagmata cavalry in this enormous interland that was patiently irrigated, well-administered, um, in spite of all the wars that had been fought there, and this would collapse, leading to a further desertification in, um, in Turkish uh, times. Um, Armenia was beyond this, was beyond, uh, let's say, the great, um, the great valleys, but it was in many ways difficult to access, right? The Byzantines come very far, in fact, just before Manzikert, they are able to, to enter Mesopotamia from the same Armenia, but it's still a very far away, away place, and the Armenians, in spite of the fact of substantially preferring Christianity over Islam, they're also... Uh, quite jealous of their uh, autonomy, and so they don't like any power fundamentally expanding too much uh, in their territory. Uh, it's evident, however, how dependent they were in turn on the Byzantines. I mean, uh, when you look at the imperial army, you realize that by the 7th century, uh, 2,000 Armenian elite cavalry, allegedly, uh, we're talking about armor, uh, armor troops, uh, were stationed on the Danubian frontier against the others, right? While others, in addition to these, uh, defended the capital Constantinople herself. So naturally, the numbers are weird. We have in the same times lots of similar figures for, uh, let's say, for other ethnicities fighting in the empire. We know, I don't know, something like five thousand Longobards stationed in Armenia herself. Some point, so you understand at this point uh, the um, this is pretty typical, especially of the sixth, early seventh century. I mean, the, the multi ethnicity of the of the Byzantine army, as such. Um, I, we, we, I will make videos on this to explain better, like how many that th that video is about the Byzantine auxiliaries gi does give you an idea of all these, also population resettlement, as we've seen. Um, um, you know, peoples invited to establish themselves in some part of this territory and so on. M many would want to actually settle in more fertile lands in uh, in Anatolia and in uh, in the Balkans. And there was definitely a lot of movement and contact between Armenia and Constantinople. The Armenians were also particularly eager in defending uh, Syria in the 7th century against the Islamic Arabs that were swarming in, into the Christian Levant uh, and that would not in fact be stopped so basically as you know for how eventually the Arabs managed to, to enter the same Anatolia to reach Constantinople and to even subjugate at some point the same Armenia but always in a decentralized way There's some sort of client states and so this makes Armenia continuing in a, in a role of perennial frontier, basically. Uh, we also have, in fact, certain Armenian Nakarars assisting the Islamic conquest of their own country, as it's obvious, because, you know, wherever you invade, there is always somebody that you can buy to, uh, to strengthen, uh, to thicken your ranks, especially in this decentralized situation when you hope that, again, the, the caliphs will give you a uh, green light to rule over your rivals in this feudal mess that... Not even the Arabs, of course, in their, at the peak of their power, are able to control directly. They're, again, atrociously um, traumatic terrains. I mean, Armenia is a place where you better not fight too much, uh, especially in this time in history, if you really care about your survival. Uh, and uh, this uh, warrior aristocracy is toughened by, by all these political, cultural, environmental... Uh, factors. And at the end of the day, you realize that uh, even the uh, the Islamic conquest of Armenia brings uh, 
to continue the, the split that had existed before between the Sasanians and the Byzantines. Uh, there are lots of backs and forths. There are other populations also across the Caucasus that intervened this, um, and so on. Uh, and the proof that the country was active was not simply put down, uh, ravaged, or zeroed, leveled, is that um, it, it was exceptionally the only part of the Byzantine Islamic frontier that was not depopulated over the early medieval centuries, right? In the 8th and the 9th century, we see that Armenia still has these troops, provides them, is active, um, and you um, you have probably a culture on its own that revives itself, including uh, for in with anti-Catholic intents. For example, the Paulicians that we have discussed uh Often in their connection with the Cathars, um, with the um, with the Manichaeans, uh, made a video a couple of weeks ago about uh, the Bogomilists of of Bulgaria, how the, there had been a a Balkan connection, in fact, with the Armenian troops that had been settled there, right? That it eventually spread in the countryside. That was again a very different place from the Byzantine coastline. At the end of the day, even though these were supposed to be subjects, military colonists, and so on. The, the Paulicians were actually destroyed by the Byzantines, um, good to them. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, they were not extirpated, however, ideologically, because part of this uh, destruction had occurred in the, within the same Armenia, and some troops were not settled just in the Balkans, but you know, deported literally there, right? They, this is something they used to do with, I don't know, the Slavs were deported if they rebelled into, into Anatolia, right? Uh, we know of some Serbians that uh, suffered this fate, and in fact, they were also um, quite frequent, uh, you know, important, important component of the Byzantine auxiliaries. And the, the Paulicians instead, are, the, the Byzantines are uh, moved them from the... Um, from the eastern frontier to basically Europe. Um, so that's also a root of the Bogomils in um, in the Balkans and beyond. It's not the only connection because uh, at the end of the day, again, the Armenians were always around. Uh, their religious military beliefs were also uh, quite fascinating. Aside from the fact that many uh, Paulician Armenians fled to to the Caliphate because Islam tolerated them. Um, they um, were still, in fact, Christians, even in their heresy. I mean, some fully uh, Orthodox um, Armenians were serving as mercenaries, uh, Islamic powers, and they're described there as believing um, to regard Jesus Christ as the Son, which is fascinating, especially uh, when you look at that video we made on the Sol Invictus. It, it's actually the same thing. There's nothing paganistic about that. It's actually the, the truest meaning of the same Catholic um, tradition. For those who still uh, think that Catholicism was born just after the schism of the 11th century, I ask to you know take a class in history of religions. Uh, in any case, um, Again, the Armenians, as you understand from their position, uh, were straddling the, the Christian and Islamic world as um, as mercenaries, right? They um, they the, in part the, some some territories of theirs that did go on uh, depopulated throughout all these times were um, colonized by both Muslims and Orthodox. Uh, uh, the the latter, the, the former, which in some cases were or uh, were were Armenian themselves, because some had simply, you know, decided after all, like in the Levant, to eventually become Muslim, uh, and um, this mechanisms that, uh, as you understand, made them available for for you know season basically brought them further south to the Mediterranean, as you know, um, the. Uh, with the arrival of the Turks and throughout all these other turbulences, um, 
the Byzantines settled the Armenians in Cilicia, where they formed a principality that is also very famous during the Crusades. I made a video about Armenian heavy cavalry during that time, uh, and we will look at that more in depth at some at some other point. Um, when you look at the Armenian mainland, you see two major feudal principalities emerging: the Bagratids in the north, practically, and the Arsruni in the south. The um, there were also uh, proper emirates of Arab Armenians, we can say, around Lake Van that uh, had a great strategy. That's where the proximity, in fact, of which Manzikert would be folked, sort of crossroad again for the Mesopotamia, the Caucasus at large, and the same Byzantine Empire. Um, and the, the Emirates were fundamentally um, loyal to the Caliphate, or at least they paid a tribute to it because they, they were an Islamic power and with the choice uh, they had to oppose themselves to this other uh, Christian Byzantine Armenian uh, forces on the other side. But again, there was a lot of commixed in there. Um, the Armenians would provide even with. Um, 1500 horsemen when needed uh, the Arab Armenian Emirates of Lake Van were particularly difficult to cope with um, by the by the Byzantines right uh, there was eventually um, coalition that was orchestrated to bring them down at some point uh, made by the the Byzantine Empire, the Kurds uh, in, in the south, uh, and the Amdanid rulers of Aleppo, that Alpine being um, Islamic, were at some point, as you know, basically a client state of Constantinople and didn't like these Armenian emirates in their uh, northeast, basically. Um, and by this point, still the presence of Armenian forces in the Byzantine army continued, uh, some had notoriously, uh, notoriously risen, made different videos about 10th century Byzantine history, to high command in Constantinople itself. There is an estimate that basically accounts for one-fourth of the entire Byzantine forces during the 9th, 10th century to have been Armenians. Right? If you look at everyone, you know, Byz Byzantine regulars, the uh, auxiliary forces and so on, it's a bit difficult actually to split these uh, at this point in history because there was a lot of commixtion, uh, of course. Uh, but consider that the Armenian military potential was some estimated in itself as something uh, between 25 and 40,000 men uh, capable of being mobilized. Um, at least back in the day, look, this is uh, an earlier figure. Uh, before the 7th century, uh, after which, in fact, we do not really see properly an Armenian capacity to do so in a concentrated way, right? And because the, the country had, again, fragmented and eventually refutalized, eventually towards the, the higher Middle Ages, things started arising uh, again, but it was much more complicated to, in fact, uh, move all these forces in a unique direction also because the, the local powers would, would have were competing with one another as we've seen but they would have also wanted to keep them within to, to reinforce to, to conquer the same Armenia rather than uh, making major expeditions or serving under somebody else's power um, in spite of this by the 10th century uh, that is the time in which in fact the term Armenian comes around more often in the higher spheres of Byzantine history as you know uh, there is a source, uh, Byzantine one, uh, claiming that uh, the Armenians made poor centuries, right? There was a sort of negative prejudice against these troops. In part, the, the type of guy that we're looking at today, because these were sort of more, um, if you want, even cheaply available troops, um, infantrymen, uh, light horsemen, or even medium horsemen of some sort. Um, and... Um, 
as such, right, even the fact that they could uh, serve in such numbers uh, in the Byzantine Empire does tell us that uh, probably the, the military institutions that were supposed at home to, to control them, to organize them in some sort of more compact military were not doing their job. They didn't have that capacity. They also probably profited from the service abroad because their maintenance would hopefully bring back some salary out of their military service. Um, and um, the, the sense is that there are, as we'll see now, some good troops in Armenia, but these, of course, cheaper ones you can afford, these larger numbers are also like uh, less reliable. And this is kind of obvious. Um, but still, Armenian armies were still sizable. We will talk about them not, not today um, per se, because this is just a unit type video. But uh, of course, the Bagratids, etc., had really um, fierce armies and very well organized one in, in the typical feudal fashion, right? Plus, the country, as we've seen, was just very um, strongly fortified, so um, in many ways they just needed to, 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 to resist, to, to be there in these times, and expansionistic capacities creating an empire were, of course, limited, um, and the most important thing was arguably consolidating from, from the within. Consider that as many as 70 castles were said to exist in the uh, province of Vaspurakan, uh, east of Lake Van alone. Right? This is not so strange. At the end of the day, um, the source uh, doesn't really specify what we mean by castles. It was completely normal um, to, uh, to have hundreds of castles, even for hundreds of square kilometers of surface. But some of these were really uh, tough nuts to crack, like up to you know, over some, uh, you know, the, the highlands, some peaks, some uh, checking passes, uh, really complicating a lot any fact attempt even of uh, power concentration. All right. Um, it said that Armenian villages, churches, and monasteries were also fortified, and this was an old habit. Because as we've seen, every once in a while, you know, if you were randomly straddling, you know, uh, the the roads of Armenia would see, I don't know, a, a savage uh, nomadic uh, horseman passing by. And that's definitely an encounter that we would have liked to avoid in your existence. Um, so looking a bit more at this infantryman and what he could be about uh, concretely in terms of arms and armor. There is one source saying, the wars of the Byzantines, the foot soldiers of the Armenians marched, and they aided them greatly. Now, as we will see again, as I anticipated before, there was a lot of cavalry, and say, just given the, the location, the Caucasus, the, the Pontic world, the fact the same Byzantine were, we, we talked, we discussed it uh, recently about the trapezitoi, etc., were particularly influenced by the uh, by nomadic warfare, not entirely adopting it until somewhat later in time, like the, the 11th century in particular, as in the larger numbers of, um, uh, in fact, mercenaries, but also settlers that were, especially in the northern frontier of the empire, just leaving a bit like in a step dimension, like the one we came from, um, there's also the feudal uh, Armenian background, but always bear in mind that these infantrymen are also habituated to fight um, together with cavalry, and in this sense against cavalry, in their native land. Right? You cannot separate the arms and saying, well, the, you know, the infantrymen just ventured somewhere, and I don't know, the cavalry did another job, right? They were always fighting combined arms tactics, and so this infantryman must be understood also under the light of this cooperation, right? It's, it's particularly important. Um, in the 4th century, uh, so we're talking Roman times, uh, in at least once where there was at some point important material availability, for also tanks, in fact, to the imperial support, etc. There were 
special corps of mountaineers trained to roll rocks onto their enemies, right? Uh, which is particularly appropriate considering the various gorges, valleys, uh, cliffs, etc. Um, and um, of, of the Armenian landscape. And uh, in siege warfare that was strictly connected with this, Armenians were seemingly equipped with iron hooks so that they could si simply grapple uh, at the uh, enemy ramparts and scaling the walls. The um, idea is that they didn't of course there, there was a segmentation here that the aforementioned Nakaras, the, the men at arms fundamentally were always, as always in siege warfare, the stormtroopers, right? Uh, some people have an idea that, you know, maybe from movies, video games, that the you 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 have to assault en masse the settlement where you're um, you're besieging it if you want to storm it, uh, and as such you have to throw literally everything you have, but without distinguishing the hierarchy that still existed within the troops that had in fact to cooperate with one another uh, in this operation, right? Uh, and this entailed, of course, the men at arms being the first ones um, on the enemy on the enemy walls. Uh, first of all, because they were just the guys with the better athletic preparation. Yes, they were covered in armor, but they that that is also useful for all the stuff that was being thrown at them while they were um, they were climbing the ladders, as we've seen, you know, Armenians being trained th themselves in the men at arms to, to roll rocks into their foes, apparently, even with uh, the specialization uh, into this um, and so the other troops would follow them, the lighter ones that would be the, the supporters that were missile troops but also melee um, forces spearmen swordsmen as the ones we see now right um, it seems uh, at least from the, the source uh, we decided to use here the, the quite influenced Byzantine casket um, decorations that the Armenian uh, infantryman is using a corselet either of quilted uh, or leather right with also artistically broad pterages at shoulder and waist um, this seems appropriate even for a land uh, that uh, was rich in iron and as such was, especially in the mounted component of, of its armies, was uh, noted for being, in fact, well equipped, right? But this doesn't mean that in the early, in the high middle ages, of course, the majority of Armenians had uh, metal armor, right? We just know that uh, Armenian defenses were regarded as particularly heavy, and part of the reason is the the one we just described this intense mountain and um, and the siege warfare with lots of difference in in, in height where again stones, javelins, etc. make uh, a terrific job. Uh, and so the um, we see also some anti armor weapons such as war axes. Right, uh, the Arab historian Mazudi, for example, noted that for cavalry, and we will talk about this you know why but again part of this infantry we're describing here was uh, cavalry in, in other moments right so uh, these guys uh, were say this, especially the guy I posted in the thumbnail was decently equipped naturally the truly the average levy peasant was worse equipped than this so the the kilt or, or leather armor was already significant a lot right what you could essentially take away from this guy's heaviness uh, you could invest in the metal armor of the of the men at arms and that's why this was a feudal society the terrages are just basically a reinforcement of some sort as some extra um, defense protection nothing impressive or exceptional uh, but something here that we note mostly aesthetically being a sort of uh, Byzantine influence, a classical remain. This is just, by the way, a, an iconographic source. Um, reality could be much less poetically lic licentious, uh, let's say. 
um, the shield that we see in the source is convex, relatively small, something like 60 centimeters in di diameter. And in fact, we know that uh, the shields too were normally not particularly heavy, but they could be much larger as well. Uh, made of leather, they would protect the backs of the soldiers from the rocks dropped from above which uh, does make sense also considering what we were just talking about about siege warfare mountain warfare um albeit um leather armor in this uh, a leather shield in this an armor uh, in this context mostly supports the idea that there was a specific anti arrow right sort of lighter and arrow and or lighter uh missile um uh ne say flying around pretty pretty frequently which is which is also the case armenian warfare is also characterized by an important degree of missile use this is true also because basically all the neighbors uh, arabs turks byzantines they make abundant use of archery so the idea especially for an infantryman of having this larger leather shield sound very much like uh, some solutions that we find in other in other countries, except um, uh, for the composition. You see, the, for example, the Islamic world ha tends to develop larger uh, quadrangular shields uh, to protect uh, against nomadic fire archery. Uh, the Armenians here do not seem to show the same thing. They seem much more feudally organized. First of all, differently from the Slavs. Uh, at least to um, in in this period, yes, I mean they were already a quite they were an older civilization. They were already feudal from quite a while, so this makes sense again. Less, I'd say what what was there was a lot of heaviness was taken from the the average trooper and invested again in the men at arm. So this solution sort of makes sense, but it also makes meaning that the the trooper that we're talking about here is on average lighter. Uh, than some European, than most European infantries of the same socialist extraction. This may have been as well for reasons, uh, needs of uh, agility on the different, uh, dif difficult, often broken terrain. I mean, if you are skirmishing against an enemy during an ambush in a, a rocky valley, um, you can't even technically deploy a, a shield wall or something. And so uh, it's important for these guys to be jumping around, also throwing javelins themselves. This could be um, part of, of their equipment uh, for sure. By the way, we notice in the in the source that here I could not post, by the way, because not because I couldn't find it, but because there is no um, copyright free picture. So that unfortunately, that's uh, just a limited selection you can see here of imagery uh, and images. But the... Uh, the helmet appears to have a leather aventail as well. Um, also, again, common. There are lots of there is lots of aventails in Caucasian warfare in general. But the idea to add this extra uh, protection, uh, to have these larger shields, etc., um, have this light but still relevant protection, is sp talking about guys that were probably able to just jump around again uh, on certain uh, hills, mountains, flanks, etc. and hitting the running, but also in fact closing in uh, in melee against basically their, their equivalent, right? So um, definitely the guy we're describing here is a heavy infantryman, but um, meaning that was mostly designed, let's say, to, to engage in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but uh, the men at arms that he had to confront were often very heavy right so in relative terms their their own he the, the the infantry heaviness was limited to what uh, this cavalryman could do uh and so it's it's a fascinating combination the one that we see in caucasian warfare we'll talk about it a bit better some other time now the thing of the axe is also interesting because there is a bit of step influence there, but probably something to do with the background, the uh, the social environmental extraction of these infantrymen. 
Uh, I mean, Armenia, yes, has an old civilization. It's, again, uh, influenced by very advanced countries, but it's fundamentally rough, right, wild uh, in its own regard. Uh, and these guys would need to live in, in an environment with this multiple uh, sort of weapons, right, in a sort of a mix between the, the sanitary world and the nomadic one to some extent. Definitely mostly fitting in the former, but still being impacted again by lots of those guys to, to whom you had to adapt. Um, there are uh, sources talking about the aforementioned um, use of axes. Uh, for example, the Armenian chronicler Stephanus or Orbelian, writing in the early 8th century in Charlemagne's times, says... Quote, having taken his armament, sp speaking of uh, here an Armenian cavalryman, and decked his superb body with a shining royal cuirass adorned with pearls, he put on a helmet topped with a tiger's head and girded his waist with a sword. Then, throwing a golden shield up upon his left shoulder and strong spear in his right hand, he sprang upon his black steed and dashed at the enemy. Consider that the Armenians were heavily influenced by um, properly chivalric epos, very, very much influenced by the Persian one that was that old and sort of stemming from the some of, of, of the most intense, in fact, um, feudal, uh, sort of heroic, divine uh, models of, like about the heavenly horses of Central Asia, etc. The, the Armenians, again, had spectated uh, to all these uh, waves of peoples throughout the millennia, and they, as, as in the elite, they had not, they hadn't helped, but you know, of course, imitating that model as well, which was functional to the subjection of the local peasantry, uh, as well. Uh, and um, in fact, the Iranian hero of uh, the late 10th century Shanama epos of uh, Iranian literature is very similarly described uh, in the way uh, the Georgian man in the panther's skin, right, uh, this other character, heroic character of the 12th century, um, is, right? And this tells you also how strong Persian influence, in fact, had always been uh, in the area since uh, antiquity. And um, in affecting especially the, the feudal culture, right, and the sort of idea of multi arms training of the individual uh, men at arms and so on. This would impact the, 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 inf the Armenian infantry in multiple ways. I mean, in a sense, they would have, especially exploiting the terrain, been able to defend themselves from especially the heavier cavalry charges. Uh, but in this way, they had also, as we just described, had to adapt to the terrain itself uh, and being able to fight with different weapons, being able to, to do this swiftly, right? To take in position, pass into other, uh, uh, to another arm, spotting the, the circumstances for attack, counterattack. Because also the enemy cavalry could exhaust itself rapidly, especially the heavies, and so this infantryman could um, turn out to be ferocious counter-attackers and quite dangerous ones. Of course, the primary weapon is the spear uh, as an obvious anti-cavalry weapon for the men, many men-at-arms, especially in the Armenian, among the Armenian enemies, there were many more lighter uh, horsemen, mostly horse archers, so um, you could take these guys on individually at some point as well, and in this sense, the average uh, finally, rank Armenian infantrymen could withstand like an, an important, um, say, even a horseman uh, of the lighter uh, type. And in group, of course, they would have uh, been even more more effective uh, against it. Uh, hence, also the large shield. Um, there were, of course, other types, not just uh, the leather one, but. Um, the dynamism of the same infantry, the fact that they were also covered by their own missile troops, the fact that they had javelins on their own, they could um, simply defend a stronghold, that's a very important uh, 
context in which these guys would fight is um, is allowing them to be fairly light after all and and the men at arms would be mostly on uh, in the front to sort of protect them and to be however assisted by them in turn right there is yet another Armenian epos that David of Sassoon made from the the, thin, uh, the dating from the 10th century possibly as early as that and there we see Armenian horsemen playing games that are very similar to the Turkish Syriad Arab Jarid um, this would apply to some of these infantrymen as well again hurling blunted javelins at each other um, as they career around uh, cavalry training ground was surely something that um, as in the uh, in the later centuries the same areas today actually you know develop some local games which um, the freemen would participate right it was a poor people's games not just one of the knights right surely there were older um, traditions the, the 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 same Roman Ipica gymnasia uh, cavalry training exercise, but even before that, right, uh, the lo- local festivals, etc., would have the the men uh, confronting themselves, like competing uh, this kind of games. That involved the average, even the average Armenian infantryman, that the guy who would have fought as an infantryman more preferably, uh, to to know how to ride a horse and how to take advantage of that. Um, there was a lot of uh, pastoralism as well in these highlands, the pasture grounds, etc. So a consistent amount of Armenian mountaineers also knew, of course, how to fight on horseback with axes, with lances. Um, and some of these guys that we see also serving in the Byzantine military uh, were about this, right? They, they, they were employed as infantry because the Byzantines just did not need them necessarily as cavalry or they didn't want, or it would have costed too much to bring their their cavalry with uh, their horse with them. Um, but back at home, they they would have known how to use a horse and knowing how to confront even a guy that used a horse. So this made them um, sort of uh, even as medium infantry, uh, cheap ones, still importantly reliable. I mean, the, the other more gentrified populations of the. Uh, hurt land of the Byzantine, uh, the coastland, say better, of, of the Byzantine Empire would have not been so, um, let's say, rough, so uh, even, say, wild to to know how to, to, to live in a dimension like that, to know what it means just to, to live in, in that privatistic system with constant clanic warfare, with uh, nomadic troops with a lot of mercenarism going around. That's the reason why the same Armenians want to go to to the Byzantine Empire because they hope that they can live there um, uh, as well. Uh, and so we find, in fact, the the Tsirid Turkish games still in in Eastern Anatolia. We do know that this did not apply uh, at the time in their equivalent just to the horsemen. Right, obviously the horsemen, the the, the men at arms, especially, would have had uh, a constant training of that form. But also the average mountaineer would um, would uh, know how to ride a horse. Maybe not to say, in fact, uh, not with a great collective training or whatever. It depends really what we're l- looking at, because some of these guys were literally serving on horseback as retinues of of their own local lord, um, even from a humble background, as he provided them with the with the mounts and all. Um, but um, I mean the the habit again of raiding of cattle raiding um, and uh, getting into this um, small actions, but still violent and crude in a tough environment was was out there right then there was also a, a more agricultural or man in all this a more peasant sedentary one let's say especially in the more developed areas of course where the center of power really was there they had the local lords had the 
the ability, the capacity, the possibility of disarming more people and in fact concentrating more in the, their their wealth um, in in the hands of some better trained horsemen. But again, this Armenian infantryman we're describing here has surely seen his share of that kind of violence and knows how to engage against cavalry as well on foot uh, and in, in attack and defense. And so he's a guy you can, uh, on average, rely on as the average soldier from this, say, broader Byzantine frontier where um, that... Uh, that has all the, the reasons to come, you know, serving you and has enough experience to, to make him reliable, for which you don't even have to train him technically in, in that ABC of what he he's already skilled without being an overly exceptional one. We will talk more first about Byzantine, um, about Armenian troops, and uh, we have already discussed, as we were saying before, in the Shilichan Armenian. Uh, cavalry as heavier types even though we're sort of lighter compared say to Frankish cavalry at the point during, during the crusades um, but um, there is um, of course a wider range of troops um, especially a greater amount of heaviness it's still elite it's still um, you know uh, it's still um something you don't you don't see in fact an average in fact this heavy infantryman is the average that you would uh you would expect to to find uh, instead and it's interesting just to think how successful the uh, after all for, for for how habitual it was actually for the armenians just to serve in the byzantine armies for such a very long time this was true as we've seen even in, in for other powers and there are also internal provincial differences uh, in this regard that we'll examine in, in another video. I, I'm just curious, because I don't remember exactly what I did about the Armenians. Not much, actually, but about Caucasian war for sure made something. I did talk about it for the Eurasian Steps playlist for sure, but I wanted to check, first of all, Armenia. Yeah, Eurasian Steppes Warfare, Georgia, Armenian, Caucasian, Albania, Byzantine Auxiliaries, Serbs, Bulgarians, Georgians, Armenians, and Kurds, Chilean Armenian Warfare. Yes, it was not just about cavalry, frankly, so you can check that out it was in a broader sense. And Caucasus. Here. Overloaded. Let's give it a second. Yeah, yeah, there is medieval Western Iranian and Islamic Caucasian warfare. Remember something about this from the 11th to the 14th century, this is a slightly later period. And yeah, that's a good video actually. It tells a lot about the circumstances. And this, ad, this video will add just to the Armenian warfare. There's no playlist yet, but. You know, the more I make these random videos about units, battles, tactics, army organization, and the more, of course, we're we're mm, sort of smoothening the, we're leveling the differences in terms of we are covering every region, right, uh, in more equal on more equal terms, and that's uh, that's what matters really for for this series. And uh, again, that's it. There would have been, again, here we stereotyped the guy. That he could have been equipped with male armor as well. But there we're talking about something heavier, all right? That's something we um, that just was less frequent, per se. Uh, so mm, that's something we will see in in another in another video. Really, what kind of um, types of troops could we cover? I can't tell you now because here I have a list that I had. Um, began probably there's not really much 
uh, about our main infantry. Consider that probably they didn't even change too much over time, right? They they received many influence. A great importance, of course, is north and south of the Caucasus as a watershed uh, in military and cultural influences. But we'll talk about Armenian cavalry, Armenian infantry, because this was this was really the average. Right then, something heavier, yes, but that's something you, you document, in fact, much better for later times. For say the uh, after the 11th century, you start having much more sources, and uh, there it becomes sort of easier to track these guys down. But this sort of solar Armenian infantryman can render well the idea of the the kind of still sedentary background, but the significantly militarized one, or at least one that had to, uh, of course, to be always up to some kind of internal instability, rivalry, competition, etc. So, I think that's um, that's really important. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye